I, I don't see a clock, so feel free to warn me when I'm if I start to run over time. You can okay, okay, I will. I will give you a signal. Yes. Sure. Okay. Então, uh, bom dia a todos. Uh, é um prazer estar aqui com todos vocês. Reconheço algumas autoridades aqui do Ministério das Relações Exteriores, o embaixador é, Fernando Abreu, o embaixador Silas Magalhães, autoridades, é, na, na pessoa deles eu cumprimento todos os colegas aqui, o Antônio Alves e todos os colegas aqui presentes. É, gostaria em primeiro lugar de dar também as boas-vindas aos colegas, é, professores e estudantes aqui presentes e é uma grande satisfação receber nesse auditório, é, chamado Paulo Nogueira Batista, né, do Ministério das Relações Exteriores, o James Hirschberg, professor de História e Relações Internacionais da Universidade de George Washington, nos Estados Unidos. Né? E o professor Hirschberg é também é diretor emérito do projeto sobre a história internacional da Guerra Fria, do Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, em uh, Washington. Né? É, muito lhe agradeço haver aceito o convite para fazer esta palestra, palestra sobre tema ligado à sua especialidade, a Guerra Fria. É, escolheu como título de sua apresentação a diplomacia brasileira secreta, a Revolução Cubana e a crise dos mísseis de 1962. O professor vem pesquisando sobre isso já há muitos anos e sobre o tema da Guerra Fria, em particular, é, sobre Cuba. Né? É com prazer é que divido a mesa com meu colega, o ministro Paulo Roberto de Almeida, que acaba de assumir o Instituto de Pesquisas e Relações Internacionais, o IPRE, órgão singular da Fundação Alexandre Guzmão, é, juntamente com o Centro de História e Documentação Diplomática, o CHDD, no Rio de Janeiro. Aproveito para dar de público as boas-vindas ao Paulo Roberto, né, que além de diplomata é respeitado professor com larga experiência acadêmica e antigo parceiro da Fundação Alexandre Guzmão. O professor Hersberg falará durante cerca de 40 minutos, em seguida teremos mais 20 minutos para perguntas. Eu peço aos, aos interessados que formulem suas perguntas por escrito e, e apresentem aqui a, a, ao IPRI, terá uma moça aqui que vai recolher a Valéria vai recolher as perguntas e depois nós formularemos. Essa apresentação uh, é, será em inglês, não é? Então, daqui para frente, nós falaremos em inglês. Então, uh, professor uh, Hersberg, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And first of all, first of all, let me apologize for speaking in English. As an ugly American, you know, this is our natural tendency to expect everyone in the rest of the world to understand us, uh, and I apologize. Um, I also want to thank Paulo and Ambassador Lima, uh, wonderful hospitality, and uh, also accepting a typical crazy American request to sweep through in two days and see zillions of pages of documents uh, at a crazy pace. Let me explain my quest uh, involving Brazil, Brazilian diplomacy, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Cuban Revolution. I'm a historian of the Cold War. Until the last couple of decades, though, 99% of Cold War history, as it was written, as it was researched, as it was argued, was an extension of United States history. The archives were partially open in Washington, memoirs were published, leaks constantly went to newspapers. And so 99% of the history was the narrative of American presidential administrations and decision making of Truman or Eisenhower or Kennedy or Johnson. And then when it came to Moscow and Beijing, you had Izvestia, Pravda, People's Daily, uh, 
uh, Khrushchev smuggled out memoirs. The world began to implode at the end of the 1980s, thanks to Gorbachev and the processes that were unleashed. It began to become apparent that it was no longer possible to write Cold War history the old-fashioned way, which was spend months or years in American archives, maybe add a little bit from the British archives if your subject was more than 30 years old, and then just add a few things uh, from the other side that were in public or that the CIA guessed or estimated was going on. But a project was created, and I was lucky enough to run it, to begin to collect the new evidence that was emerging from, first of all, and Central Europe, you know, the former Warsaw Pact countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Romania. Uh, then from the Soviet archives themselves that finally began to crack open as the Soviet Union itself vanished into history. And also, thanks to Deng Xiaoping's modernization, you began to have Chinese materials begin to open. And stories like the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the U.S. hostility toward China and vice versa, uh, what was known during the Cold War in the United States as Red China or the Chai Coms uh, in the documents. Finally, you began to get a non-U.S. perspective. One of the subjects that I was extremely interested in because it went back to my undergraduate thesis in history, which was about the making of the atomic bomb by J. Robert Oppenheimer and his friends at Los Alamos during World War II in the beginning of the nuclear arms race. I had been very interested in the whole story of nuclear crises, and especially the Cuban Missile Crisis. And one day, exactly 20 years ago, something happened. I am a document fanatic. I believe where possible to get the original contemporary evidence, not simply as it was remembered. I have interviewed many former policymakers who remember things the way they wish it had happened, not necessarily the way it had happened. And also, of course, when you are writing documents at the time, you don't know the end of the story. And so you can try to recreate history in an interesting way. And 20 years ago, I was sitting in Washington, D.C., and I was editing a journal uh, for this Cold War international history project that the ambassador mentioned to me at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I was newly opened Soviet documents that had emerged from the Russian archives about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was writing annotation notes. And what of the categories of documents, there are hundreds of cables, telegramma, from the Soviet ambassador in Havana. And on one in one particular cable, October 31st, 1962, just a few days after the peak of the missile crisis, the Soviet ambassador described a conversation with Fidel Castro, in which Fidel Castro described a meeting with a Brazilian visitor who had been sent by Brazilian President Goulart, who made proposals to end the U.S.-Cuban confrontation and to begin a new era, essentially, in Cuba's relationship with the hemisphere, which was extremely hostile. And as I began to look through the hundreds of books and references about the missile crisis to find information about this Brazilian emissary, I discovered nothing. And I began to look into the story. And the combination of declassified American documents, British documents, Canadian documents, eventually Brazilian documents, and then later Czech, Soviet, Israeli, Yugoslav, other international documents, especially from countries that had ambassadors in Havana because the United States had already broken relations, so there was no U.S. embassy in Havana anymore. It revealed a fascinating story that at the peak of the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
In fact, on the most dangerous night in human history, October 27th, 1962, John F. Kennedy secretly turned to Brazil to try to send a message to Fidel Castro. But the more I explored the story, the more I discovered that not only was this episode completely missing from the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, in fact, when I told friends, even colleagues, who had written books on the Cuban Missile Crisis that I was working on the Brazilian dimension of Cuban Missile Crisis, I owe the exact same answer, which was, what Brazilian dimension of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Nobody knew there was a Brazilian dimension of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But when I explored it, I discovered this was simply the climax of three years of secret Brazilian diplomatic efforts to mediate between Fidel Castro's revolution in Havana and the United States government in Washington. This was a process that began under Kubitschek in Brazil, even before he moved to Brasilia, and Eisenhower in Washington. It continued through Quadros, mysterious but fascinating eight-month period of January to August 1961 with uh, John F. Kennedy, the new president, a uh, period that included uh, the Bay of Higgs, most famously, and then, of course, the infamous or notorious to some people, Declaration of Che Guevara, uh, just before Quadros himself resigned. And then it also included a couple of mediation efforts under Goulart himself. But the whole story climaxed at the peak of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, what I propose to do in my remaining time is to briefly give an old story, which I understand is still mostly unfamiliar to Brazilian history. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions and to examine any particular aspect in greater depth. Now, this is a project of mine that will eventually, God willing, produce a book uh, that you will be able to read it. It has already produced multiple journal articles and conference papers, but I will give you a very superficial overview of the story. Now, actually, my investigation has led me to the story of Brazil's reaction to the Cuban Revolution. And that, in turn, has led me to a fascinating person of Itamarati history, Vasco Tristan Leteo de Cunha. Now, what is so fascinating, uh, I discovered, is that he is mostly remembered, I understand, at least by many people, as the first foreign minister of Brazil under the military that took over, the, the new government that took over in 1964 after... And he presided over the break in Brazil's relations with Cuba in May 1964 because of Cuban support for communist subversion in the hemisphere. And uh, Leteo de Cunha was foreign minister for two years and then he became in Washington DC to Lyndon Johnson. And he was very supportive of the US policy in Vietnam. Uh, he had already supported the uh, US intervention in the Dominican Republic. So he is remembered as a strong anti-communist. But what turned out to be fascinating is that he arrived to become Brazil's ambassador in Havana at the end of November 1956, actually with his family on a boat from Rotterdam. He had been the Brazilian ambassador in Brussels. He arrived in Cuba on the same day that Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, Ernesto Guevara, and about 80 compañeros took a rickety boat the grandma from Mexico to Cuba to launch what turned into the Cuban Revolution. And for the last two years of Fulgencio Batista, uh, Ambassador Leteo de Cunha had a front row seat to the Cuban Revolution. Not only that, he and his wife, Virginia, and their daughter, uh, Isabel, uh, became extremely sympathetic to the revolution against Batista. Not only that, the Brazilian embassy in Havana became known as the place to gain asylum 
if you were trying to escape the secret police of Batista and support the revolution. And dozens uh, of pro-Castro revolutionaries ended up finding asylum, refuge, in the Brazilian embassy in Havana, including Fidel Castro's sister, Juanita. And uh, it's funny, uh, Ambassador de Cunha had a British education and was known as being somewhat reserved, but his wife, Virginia, was known as having a more passionate French temperament. And actually, she used to drive uh, American diplomats crazy because after the revolution took power, she would strongly applaud Fidel Castro's speeches criticizing the United States. And the Americans really began to resent this. But when Fidel Castro to take power, the very first foreign diplomat he came to see was the Brazilian ambassador, Sierra Maestra from the mountains. He had written letters to the ambassador's wife thanking her for the good care she was taking of the various uh, revolutionaries in the embassy. And uh, I've even been told that not only was Fidel Castro's best foreign friend when he first took power, the Brazilian ambassador, but that during this period, Ambassador de Cunha was even a father figure to Fidel Castro. He was 23 years older. Fidel Castro was alienated, estranged from his own biological father. And there was a honeymoon of very warm relations. In fact, a, a dinner was, a party was thrown. Um, uh, Castro would come late at night for, for meetings with the ambassador. The, the family knew uh, the, Revo the Barbudos, the bearded ones, very well. And I've also found that in, uh, this affection between the Brazilian ambassador's family and Fidel Castro and the revolutionary leadership was became so well known that it began to annoy American officials. Uh, the American ambassador, Bansal, even wrote a letter that was classified until recently complaining that the, the Brazilian ambassador and his wife especially were too sympathetic. Uh, the French ambassador, whose um, son would actually date the uh, daughter of the Brazilian ambassador, um, would, after she had an affair with one of the Barbudos, that's a whole other story, uh, uh, wrote a long 10-page analysis that I found in the archives in, in Paris, uh, concluding that uh, the Brazilian ambassador was too willing to accept the explanations and excuses of Fidel Castro, that he was not really a communist, that he was just bargaining for position. But what was fascinating is that by the summer of 1916, I traced this process in my, um, the Mateo de Cunha family, not just the ambassador, but his wife and daughter, turned from being enthusiastic supporters and sympathizers of the revolution to being first disillusioned and disturbed and then extremely alarmed by the communist direction of the revolution, its increasing ties to the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc and the communist world, and its repression domestically against the free press, against the church, against dissidents, real or imagined. Um, even some who had been part of the revolution were beginning to flee Castro. And at one point, even Fidel Castro, the same Fidel Castro's sister, Juanita, who had taken asylum in the Brazilian embassy from Batista, began to come back to the Brazilian embassy to get asylum from her own brother. And she was great friends with the Brazilian ambassador's wife. And at one point, the Brazilian ambassador's wife and Fidel Castro's sister became so uh, congruent, unified in their alarm at the direction of the revolution that it was revealed by Fidel Castro's sister uh, six years ago, seven years ago in her memoirs, that it was the Brazilian ambassador's wife who put her in touch with the CIA agent, uh, first in Cuba and then in Mexico City, in order to become a CIA informant against her own brother. She has insisted she did not cooperate with trying to assassinate her own brother, but she became a source. Not only that, um, 
Matteo de Cunha, by the time he ended his ambassadorship at the beginning of 1961 to become Secretary General of Itamarati for Quadros, he had become convinced that Castro's Cuba represented a serious threat to the hemisphere and was actually cooperating with former Castro associates who were conspiring to overthrow him and would be part of the Bay of Pigs, even. And uh, during 1960, you also have, as de Cunha is becoming disillusioned with Castro, the first mediation effort. And actually, this came as Eisenhower visited Brazil in February 1960, a visit some of you might be familiar with. Um, in Havana, the Brazilian ambassador and the Argentine ambassador spent months shuttling between the American ambassador and with Fidel Castro, trying to arrange some sort of reconciliation. Um, this peaked, actually. There was an all-night asada from midnight to 5 in the morning. Uh, the Argentine ambassador between Fidel Castro and the Brazilian, Argentine, and other Latin American ambassadors in which they tried to get Fidel Castro to agree not to leave the Latin American family go completely over to the Soviet side. These efforts failed, though. And by 1961, uh, there was uh, uh, even uh, a good deal of sympathy on the part of uh, Latteo de Cunha for the efforts to overthrow Castro. Now. This did not mean, however, that he said this openly. In fact, he was a strong supporter of the independent foreign policy of Jaime Cuadros. And this included two last minute, 11th hour, I'm not sure what the Brazilian cliche is for something just before time runs out, secret diplomatic efforts by Brazil to mediate between Cuba and the United States just before the Bay of Pigs. And this involved two trips by Leteo de Cunha as Secretary General of Itamarati to Havana. Officially, these were simply to wrap up personal affairs and you know, make, take some of his belongings and uh, escort his daughter and her family off. But the real purpose was to meet with Fidel Castro because it was evident that and Brazil was well aware that the United States CIA was conspiring with anti-Castro Cuban rebels in Miami, in Central America, to train them to try to overthrow Fidel Castro's government. Um, Leteo de Cunha, with the authority of Foreign Minister Afonso Lorinos and uh, President Cuadros, brought a formula in which he tried to convince Fidel Castro to accept to accept Cuba's neutralization in the Cold War to become a country like Finland or even Yugoslavia, where its internal system could be socialist without outside interference because Brazil consistently supported the rights of self-determination and this territorial integrity and sovereignty of nations and non-intervention in internal affairs, but that Cuba would promise not to become uh, part of the Soviet bloc or a base for Soviet military personnel um, and also restrain Cuban efforts to support communist in subversion in the Western Hemisphere. And this was a formula uh, that uh, was passionately argued in late night meetings, after midnight meetings between Leteo de Cunha and Fidel Castro and separately with Che Guevara and with President Dorticos of, of Cuba, uh, and after which he would fly from Havana to Miami and meet with an American official. And so Brazil became actually an unofficial conduit for some communications because, of course, the U.S.-Cuban uh, relations had been broken at the end of the Eisenhower administration. Uh, these efforts, of course, failed, although they're quite fascinating, and the Bay of Pigs took place. One other Brazilian mediation effort is worth noting under Quadras at the Punta del Este conference in Uruguay in August 1961, which was the planning conference for the Alliance for Progress, which John F. Kennedy announced in March 1963, which was, of course, based 
on Eusalino's uh, OPA, the Operation Pan America, but with an American cast and, of course, with John Kennedy's stamp. There was a meeting of foreign ministers, Organization of American States. And at that meeting, Ernesto Che Guevara, wearing fatigues and his beard and uh, uh, his charisma, represented Cuba, whereas a very stodgy Republican, uh, American Treasury Secretary, uh, Douglas Dillon, represented the United States. But the Brazilian and Argentine delegations managed to bring together uh, Che Guevara with one of John F. Kennedy's top aides, a guy by the name of Dick Goodwin, Richard Goodwin, who was known as one of Kennedy's whiz kids. He was actually the driving force behind the Alliance for Progress. And they had a long conversation on the floor of an apartment at a party after midnight. And this was, in fact, the hover took place between the Kennedy administration and Castro's government. And uh, it began with Che Guevara thanking the United States for the Bay of Pigs because it gave the government in Havana a chance, an excuse to crack down on all of its enemies. And it was a search for what was called a modus vivendi, a way of doing business to, restrict, to limit the confrontation between Cuba and the United States. Probably the funniest part of the meeting was that um, Che Guevara gave a box of Cuban cigars for Goodwin to bring to JFK in, in the White House. And the story goes that, because uh, he knew that Kennedy liked cigars, the story goes that Goodwin gave the box to Kennedy, and Kennedy opened it, Cohibas, I think they were, and he, he lit one up, took a puff or two, and then he thought, hmm, you should have smoked the first one. <laughs> just in just in case uh, Castro was trying to poison Kennedy, just like the CIA was trying to poison Castro at that time. Uh, but of course, the Brazilian aspect of it is this, of course, was just a couple of days before Che Guevara proceeded to Brazil and had his famous meeting with Quadros that had disastrous consequences, only opposed by Carlos Lacerda, the military, other figures, and was part of the mysterious process that led Quadros to resign just a few days later. How much time do I have left? Yes, Seven or eight okay. Minutes. Now, Goulart, of course, took over for Quatros after some uh, very chaotic and tense days in which there was even talk of possible civil war. And Fidel Castro uh, announced that uh, Cuba would support the, his side if there was a civil war in Brazil. U.S. officials did not like Goulart. He had a very bad reputation in Washington, and it did not help his reputation that in August, just a few days earlier, he had been on a trade mission first to Moscow, the Soviet Union, and then to Beijing and China, uh, to the People's Republic of China, what was known as Red China in the United States. And actually, we now have the Chinese records of those conversations, which are... But Goulart did become president of Brazil. And before the missile crisis, there was one very interesting mediation effort. Uh, in August, I'm sorry, in April 1962, Goulart visited the United States. This was a very high visibility visit. He gave a speech to a joint session of Congress. This was the honeymoon between Goulart and John Kennedy when Kennedy hoped that Goulart and Brazil would be uh, success stories for the Alliance for Progress. It did not work out that way, but there was that moment. But what's interesting in terms of my story is this also happened just as there was an internal power struggle between Fidel Castro and the pro-Soviet Cuban Communist Party, the, the PSP, the Popular Socialist Party. And the Brazilian foreign minister, Santiago Dantas, the US Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, that Brazil's ambassador in Havana, Luis Bastian Pinto, could try to probe Fidel to see if Fidel would be willing to break relations with Moscow and the Soviet bloc and return to the hemisphere 
and in return for which the United States and the Organization of American States would lift the, what was already an economic embargo that actually continued until today in many ways, until Barack Obama began to lift it uh, about a year, uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, the U.S. was very cautious because in American domestic politics, it was impossible to have any direct communications between an American president and Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro was seen as completely off limits for any kind of American authorized communication. But the Americans authorized Brazil to go forward. And uh, American document that's been declassified in which the Secretary of State discussed this with the director of the CIA. And they agreed that if it was very unlikely to work. But if it did work, and Fidel Castro did agree to break with the Soviet Union, that would be the first step. And the second step is that the U.S. would get rid of Castro anyway. <laughs> In other words, the U.S. was preparing not only to double-cross Fidel Castro, but also to double-cross Brazil as a mediator between the two of them. Now, the Brazilian ambassador in Havana did meet with Fidel Castro in late, May, uh, late April 1962. Fidel welcomed the conversation, promised to think about it, but never followed up. It never went anywhere. And this is where matters rested at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And what makes the Cuban Missile Crisis so interesting and different, well, there are many things, but one is that in all of the previous Brazilian secret diplomatic efforts, to mediate between Washington and Havana, the U.S. was very reluctant, reflected these efforts. For example, during Quadros, uh, the Cuban deputy foreign minister came to Brasilia, met with Enrio, and met with Arenos, and then Quadros, and Brazil agreed to have a joint mediation effort with Mexico and Ecuador, the year before it had a joint mediation effort with Mexico and Canada. And the U.S. sort of indicated that, no, this is not a problem between the United States and Cuba. This should be a problem between the entire OAS, the entire hemisphere and Cuba. And they resisted the idea of a bilateral dis dispute. Well, and they were very hesitant about mediation. But during the Cuban Missile Crisis, John F. Kennedy and his advisors became so desperate for war that uh, by October 26th, 27th, Friday and Saturday of the week of the missile crisis, after Kennedy on October 22nd announced the detection, the existence of Soviet nuclear capable missiles in Cuba, they agreed to try something that they realized would probably not work, but it was worth a try, which was to send a message to Fidel Castro, tell him that if he would kick out the Soviet missiles, if he would eject the Soviet missiles, that Cuba would welcome back into the hemisphere. But this was so politically sensitive that what they ended up doing was the following method. Kennedy and his advisors approved a message but this message was written in Washington, cabled to the American embassy in Rio de Janeiro, who was still in Rio de Janeiro, it had not moved to Brasilia yet, translated into Portuguese, typed on a plain piece of paper with no U.S. embassy markings, and then on midnight, on Saturday night, October 27th, the most dangerous night in human history, uh, as the U.S. was preparing possibly for an invasion of Cuba as at the same day that an American U-2 intelligence plane was shot down over Cuba, the same day, night that John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, uh, had a secret meeting with the Soviet ambassador to uh, uh, set up a possible deal. That same night, the U.S. ambassador in Rio, Lincoln Gordon, went to the apartment of Hermes Lima, who was the acting foreign minister because Santiago Dantas was sick, and he was also the prime minister. And Lincoln Gordon gave him this text and said this should be presented to Fidel Castro as a Brazilian proposal, that Brazil has reason to believe 
that if you do A, the United States will do B. And one interesting thing, uh, the Americans warned the Brazilians, you must send a special courier personally to deliver this message to Havana, to the Brazilian embassy in Havana. He didn't say why, but we know it was because the US was intercepting the Brazilian cables. And the next morning, <laughs> copies and summaries of Brazilian diplomatic cables would be part of the CIA's report to Kennedy and his advisors. And the US did not even want secret documents to tell the US bureaucracy that it was sending a message through Brazil to Cuba. Now, the US had hoped that the message to Castro would be delivered through Bastian Pinto, who they trusted as a reliable professional diplomat and anti communist. But Goulart instead sent his chief of his military household, the chief de Casa Militar, General Albino Silva, not only to deliver the message to Havana, but also to have the meeting with Fidel Castro. And the next day he had, a, that same day, he had a meeting with the Soviet ambassador and he explained he was doing this because he didn't trust Itamarati. He was going to use his own man to control the process. And so even though there is one cable in the Itamarati archives about the meeting between Albino Silva and Fidel Castro, the three-page handwritten letter and then the 14-page handwritten report from Albino Silva went directly to Goulart. And actually, this is the, the one document I would call the holy grail that I'm still trying to find about the story. And unfortunately, I don't think it ever made it into the Itamarati archives. I just have a sinking feeling. And it's funny, I had a chance to ask Fidel Castro about this story at a conference in Havana in 2002 on the 40th anniversary of the missile crisis. And he had virtually no memory of the meetings he had. He had a long meeting with Albino Silva. And why? Because he simply thought this is the Brazilian diplomacy trying to interfere above its level in a crisis between the superpowers. So he paid virtually no attention. He didn't know that the Brazilian message was really, in large measure, drafted in Washington and approved by John Kennedy. And so I handed it to him and said, this was actually approved by John Kennedy. And when he read it, he said, there's no chance that we would have accepted this message. You know, this, we would not break with the Soviet Union, even though Fidel Castro was furious with Nikita Khrushchev for agreeing to withdraw the missiles. But uh, it's funny, uh, even Kennedy's associates uh, did not believe that there was a U.S. message sent to Fidel Castro, approved by John Kennedy, but through Brazil. And so it turned out that uh, this was the peak of Brazil's efforts. Uh, now, Brazil had other diplomatic efforts around the time of the missile crisis, including uh, one thing that Carlo Patti uh, has been exploring in Guyana. Guyana. Uh, it's the missile crisis that helped stimulate Brazil's diplomatic effort to support a nuclear free zone or a nuclear weapons free zone in Latin America. And this is going to lead five years later to the Treaty of Tlatelelco uh, in uh, 1967. Uh, Brazil actually tried to come up with a solution to the Cuban Missile Crisis by an agreement to denuclearize Latin America. Um, that also went nowhere, even though the Soviets did not oppose it. It actually fit with the Polish Rapatsky plan. The Poles had also pushed a nuclear free zone in Europe a few years before, but the Cubans were so furious, they vetoed it. Now, this is the climax of my story, but the investigation that I've been pursuing is really of a moment in the history of Brazil, Cuba, the Cold War, and also revolution in Latin America that in my mind has never been explored in this way because there are a million books, especially in the United States, about the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Revolution, U.S.-Cuban relations. There are also some very good books about U.S.-Brazilian relations, and of course there are many good books about the internal politics 
of Brazil and the independent foreign policy and Brazil's foreign policy and about leftist movements in Brazil. This is the height of uh, the Sino-Soviet split, but also the enthusiasm for revolution in, in Latin America. But what no other book has done, with the partial exception of Moniz Bandera or De Martia Fidel, is look at the triangular U.S.-Brazilian-Cuban relation, or you could really think of it as the quadrangular U.S.-Brazilian-Cuban communist world relationship, which is now possible to explore because you not only have the wonderful archives here in Brasilia, but fantastic opportunities to use not only U.S. archives and the easily available Western archives, I've mentioned the British archives, the Canadian archives, the French archives, others, but vast access now to communist world, former communist world archives. Even though the Cuban archives are just beginning to open, um, you can now internationalize this story in a way that was formerly impossible. And actually, uh, I take it you are all online. Um, I've been at George Washington University for the last 20 years almost, since 1997. But I still have close relations with the Cold War International History Project. And four years ago, for the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was a guest editor of an 807-page small print, it was like a telephone book, issue, let me, let me stop that. No, no, no. Remind me, okay. I don't even know who that's from. Um, a telephone book of translated documents from more than 20 countries about the Cuban Revolution, the Bay of Pigs, but mostly about the Cuban Missile Crisis, including from Latin America, Brazilian documents, Mexican documents, Chilean documents, but also every country in the Warsaw Pact, Chinese documents. When Che Guevara met with Mao Zedong in November 1960, these two, I have no idea why they is doing that. Um, when these two revolutionaries of the late 20th century met, we don't have the records from Cuba, but we now have the records from China. So the opportunities for internationalizing Brazil's... I'm going to turn this entire thing off if I possibly can. Slide to power off, thank you. I tell my students, turn it off, turn it off. So I'm very humiliated that I am the one whose cell phone is bothering everybody. Um, but the opportunities for doing Brazilian history internationally are enormous. And, and I should just mention, you know, for example, uh, the Foreign Relations of the United States series, which includes, of course, U.S. relations with Brazil, is online now. But also, and this is a, a fantastic opportunity, anyone looking at the 70s, um, there are now more than 2 million pages of all of the cable traffic between the State Department and all of the U.S. embassies and missions. It is all online. You don't need to go to College Park, Maryland on an extremely expensive research visit. It's nice. It's, you know, there are things you can see there you cannot see online, but you can do serious primary source research online in, in ways that were unimaginable earlier. In any case, let me stop now, and I'll be happy to uh, discuss any aspect of my work or of, Cu of Brazil, Cuba, and the Cold War. Thank you. start by thanking Professor uh, Hirschberg for his very interesting uh, account of the uh, uh, result of a very uh, deep uh, and, in, and encompassing research on the uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil's role uh, in, uh, uh, as, as you see it. Uh, uh, and I, I would like to First of all, to, to open the floor, I don't know if you have a, uh, uh, some questions that you'd like to make, but I, I would start by, uh, uh, again, or from the point of view of FUNAG, uh, uh, sharing with you uh, this feeling of the importance of knowledge. 
uh, the importance of knowledge and of acquiring knowledge of reflecting upon um, uh, what uh, uh, you we have uh, uh, sometimes available and uh, we we do not research and um, and the importance for students to uh, also to think about uh, their uh, role uh, in, in digging in, uh, this uh, information and uh, studying and analyzing because sometimes uh, the history that is available is not necessarily the complete uh, uh, story you know? and uh, so it's uh, always important for you to research and to go into different documents, not only to have the view, and this is important for the opening that the Professor Hirschberg is doing with his visit, is also uh, to uh, create the opportunity, not only from seeing the things from the point of view of uh, the American archives, the US Department archives, but to also seeing uh, from the point of view of the Brazilian uh, archives and of the Brazilian uh, uh, reading of uh, of the situation. Huh? So, uh, yeah, and I should please. just make one other point since I I'm so happy you know, many students have come. I teach the undergraduate uh, U.S. foreign policy history class at George Washington University with 250 students, and one thing I do have them choose an event during the Cold War, the Missile Crisis, the U.S. escalation in Vietnam, a uh, summit meeting between Nixon and Mao or Nixon and... But compare how the event was covered in the newspapers at the time, the New York Times, the Washington Post, to the secret documents to see how foreign policy looks different in the classified secret world compared to the public impression that is given, uh, whether through public statements, press conferences, leaks to journalists, because you know some of you might be interested in history, some of you may not. And if, but if you're interested in present and future policy, when the secret documents might not be available 20 years, 30 years, forever, I think it can help your insight into what may be going on behind the scenes to have some experience of looking at the archives and comparing how did an event look to the public in you know, a globo in wherever compared to how does it look in the secret the confidential the urgentissimo the documents that the public does not have access to and and that is a very interesting part of sort of re redrafting you know, journalism is sometimes called the first draft of history. And so it's a fascinating experience to take that first draft and to move it forward to a second draft. Yeah, but um, uh, another point is also uh, to, uh, to research and to think of the Operação Pan-Americana uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, as an important moment of Brazilian diplomacy. Uh, a moment in which uh, uh, Juscelino Kubitschek uh, perceives that uh, there, there was a danger, and he tries to to convey the message to Eisenhower, né? and then to to Kennedy, uh, and uh, this message uh, was uh, very useful, but it was not fully taken by the Americans. The Americans did not fully understood, uh, but this is an important moment for Brazilian diplomacy that is not studied as it should. And uh, perhaps the, the coming of Professor Hirschberg here uh, is an invitation to all of us to go deep and study the, the importance of Brazilian diplomacy in the Cold War and in particular uh, the efforts by Juscelino Kubitschek to, to show that the problem was not East-West. For Latin America, the problem of uh, South, uh, the, problem of the, the problems of the South were, were really uh, much more uh, important and there was some danger in that.
but it's really fascinating. I, I, I just want to share with you, and uh, I think the floor uh, is open to questions, or do we have yeah. some questions? Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Professor James Hirschberg. I was pleased by your uh, uh, explanation. This morning, uh, we were together yesterday evening uh, discussing many of those issues. I have here a, a, a secret question, uh, a non indictment <laughs> question that was presented, but uh, gostaria também de oferecer aos alunos que queiram fazer perguntas por escrito ou oral em português, que se sintam livres, a gente uh, pode transmitir, mas o professor James Hirschberg compreende português, uh, estamos tendo uma gravação em inglês, mas uh, questões em português são Benvenidos. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one uh, this uh, secret question, and the other mine. Uh, I start to read to you the question uh, put by someone in the audience, Professor. As you said, the U.S. were intercepting Brazilian messages, especially on this event. Being so, what was the participation of American figures in Brazil, such as Ambassador Lincoln Gordon? Mm -hmm and Colonel Vernon Walters. Uh, I suppose that Vernon Walters was late in Brazil. Well, yeah, he, two he there, yeah. lot of concerns about President Django mm -hmm. and of Brazilian figures such as uh, Tenant Goberi de Couto Silva, who has interesting observations about Cuba. Okay, uh, my question uh, goes uh, back before the the crisis. Of course, the Soviet uh, nuclear weapons uh, in Cuba. Do you consider the main uh, responsible the the two people engaged in this affair, which uh, was more responsible for the installation mm -hmm. of Soviet device in Cuba? Was Nikita Khrushchev desire to retaliate? against uh, NATO or uh, U.S. Uh, uh, spying in Turkey or um, other other place, or Fidel Castro desire to mount, let's say, a uh, leverage against the U.S., uh, just as Mao has done uh, during the Korean War. Uh, how do you perceive the decision to put missiles uh, uh, in Cuba? Thank you. Yeah, this, I'll answer the second one first because it chronologically happens before the crisis. This is a mystery that has existed since the crisis because there have been conflicting stories. Nikita Khrushchev has always put out the words that the Soviet Union did it for the sake of Cuba, to defend Cuba as an altruistic, generous act of defending a socialist ally. Whereas uh, Fidel Castro has said, no, um, we did not ask for these. We agreed to accept these missiles for the good of socialism. And some materials on this are still missing. But what has come out, both from opening Russian documents and also this conference in Havana in 2002 was very revealing about this. There was also a conference on the 30th anniversary of the missile crisis in Havana in 1992, 10 years earlier, is it's clear that the impulse to send the missiles came from Khrushchev in the spring of 1962. And he had many motives. Uh, for one thing, the Soviet... Um, Berlin was one motive. In fact, one mystery is whether, as uh, some officials believed at the time and some historians believe, uh, just as background for, for you, the biggest crisis of the Cold War from 1958 to 1961 was over Berlin, in which the, that is now the capital of a United Germany, of course, was divided. East Berlin, was communist and was the de facto capital of East Germany. West Berlin was under the control of the Western powers and was linked to West Germany, but you had to transit East German territory. And of course, this had been the case of the during the 1948-49 blockade of Berlin that was overcome with the Berlin airlift. 
And it was the case again, Khrushchev threatening to blockade Berlin again. And he pulled back from this threat at the end of 1961, but he was frustrated. He, and uh, uh, the Soviet archives have revealed a, a secret Kremlin meeting in January 1962 in which he said he wanted to have an offensive policy toward the West. And there's no question that Khrushchev would have liked to uh, pressure West Berlin. And in fact, when the missiles were discovered in Cuba, some American officials thought, does he want us to invade Cuba so he can retaliate against West Berlin? That seems to have been one motive, but not the most important motives. One other motive is that uh, Khrushchev brag, boast, that the Soviets were pumping out missiles like sausages. And of course, the Soviets had orbited Sputnik on October 4th, 1957, before the Americans were able to orbit a satellite. And on April 12th, 1961, just before the Bay of Pigs, the Soviets had orbited, had, had orbited Yuri Gagarin. The first astro man in space was a cosmonaut and a communist member, uh, member of the Soviet Communist Party. He later visited uh, Brazil. And so Khrushchev wanted to create the impression that the Soviets were ahead in missiles. And in the United States, there was debate over what was called a missile gap in American domestic politics that the Soviets were getting ahead. But in 1961, the US was able to get better intelligence. And in late 1961, the US revealed that there was a missile gap, but it favored the United States. The US actually had far more missiles that could hit the Soviet Union and more accurately than the Soviets had that could hit the United States. Also, there had been a gigantic accident that had, uh, in which one of the Soviet missiles exploded on the launch pad, killed about 200 people, including leaders of the Soviet missile program. So the Soviet missile program was in deep trouble. And so one motive, and the motive that the Kennedy administration took very seriously at the time, was that by putting medium shorter range missiles in Cuba that could hit the United States, this would be a cheaper alternative the long range intercontinental missiles that could be deployed in the Soviet Union. So uh, it was seen as a way to remedy to uh, lessen Soviet nuclear inferiority. However, now another motive that is taken more seriously is that it's now clear that Khrushchev had become personally committed to the Cuban Revolution. And actually he, he had advisors on the Politburo, the ruling circles of the Kremlin, who said it's hopeless to try to keep a socialist revolution in power in Cuba. This is the United States sphere of influence. Um, they will crush the Cubans it is not even worth trying to defend. And Kennedy, in early 1962, had actually had an interview with Khrushchev's son-in-law, who was a journalist, in which Kennedy had made a comment, more or less, that you knew what to do in Hungary, in your sphere of influence. The Soviet Union, of course, had invaded Hungary in 1956. Implication that we need to learn from you, and we will get rid of our annoying irritant in our sphere of influence, but that Khrushchev overruled his advisors and insisted on arming and supporting Castro both indirectly through countries like Czechoslovakia and others in Eastern Europe, and also directly. And so the defense of Cuba is also important of the split. I, again, apologize for ancient history if you are not interested in the Cold War, but this is when the Sino-Soviet split was breaking out and the Chinese were accusing the Soviets of being weak. Yes, of being revisionist. And Khrushchev's view was, hey, the Chinese and Mao talk big, but by defending Cuba, we will show we can act. And it's kind of funny, Cuba was wavering in the Sino-Soviet split and also wavering in Brazil because this is when the Communist Party of Brazil, actually the Brazilian Communist Party of Luis Carlos Prestes was pro-Moscow, pro-Khrushchev and believed in peaceful coexistence and a peaceful road to socialism. Whereas Francisco Julio and the Ligas Camponeses believed in 
violent revolution in the Northeast and in Brazil. And you also had the Pese Dobe, a pro-China wing that broke off in Brazil from the Brazilian Communist Party to support violent revolution in Brazil. And Fidel Castro wavered between supporting the pro violent means to power Brazilian revolutionaries and going along with Prestes and the pro-Moscow Brazilian communists. But this reflected where he wavered. He hesitated in the Sino-Soviet split because as a Brazilian diplomat once commented from Havana, I believe actually it might have been another diplomat too, um, Castro's stomach, I'm sorry, Castro's heart is in Beijing. Stomach is in Moscow. Because with the American embargo, it was economically dependent on the Soviets. And actually, I asked Castro personally about this at this conference in 2002. And he said, I will give you my shortest answer ever. Because I asked, was there a chance that Cuba could support China in the Sino-Soviet Sino split? And of course, Castro was favorite, famous for giving answers six hours, seven hours, eight hours, with no bathroom break, no toilet break. Um, and he said, I will give you my shortest answer ever for one word, three letters, O-I-L, oil. They were completely dependent on Soviet oil and, and refi Soviet refining of oil. And so there was Cuban sympathy for armed struggle and revolution, including in Brazil. Um, but he was persuaded that he had to go along with Khrushchev's method. And eventually he was convinced that by Prestes, Prestes visited uh, Cuba and told Castro that if you support revolution in Brazil, the result will not be revolution, it will be the military taking over, which is of course what happened a year later. So it, there are other reasons, uh, but those are some of the reasons Khrushchev chose to put the missiles. Now about Gordon and Vernon Walters, it's very interesting, and again, I don't have time for a detailed explanation, because the Cuban Missile Crisis happened at the same time as a crisis in U.S.-Brazilian relations. There had just been the elections of the, the federal uh, parliamentary elections of October 7th, 1962, and Goulart, in January 1963, was about to seek a plebiscite or a presidential system and get rid of the parliamentary system that had been imposed when he took over from Quadras. But also, U.S. officials in Washington and in Rio were afraid that numerous ultra-nationalist and even communist figures were rising in Goulart's government, including his brother-in-law, you know, Bra in, uh, Brizola. Uh, the governor, um, and there were discussions in Washington at the highest level um, about whether or not to support a military coup. And in fact, uh, the XCOM, it's fascinating, in December 1962, just after the missile crisis, there was a discussion of Kennedy and his advisors about options in Brazil to support a military coup. Uh, the other was to pressure Goulart to make changes through a confrontation. And it was decided not to support a military coup yet because the right. But instead, JFK sent his brother, Bobby Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, the attorney general, to Brasilia. And he had a confrontation with Goulart on December 17th, 1962. The records are available from the uh, United States Archives. They've been available for many years bring Goulart to essentially clean communists out of his house. Goulart always made excuses, saying, I am working with them. They will not push me too far. But in terms of the question of Gordon and Walters, uh, at this point, Walters was providing translations. Vernon Walters, of, of course, had translated with the Brazilian contingent in Italy in 1943-44. He had come as the military attache to the U.S. Embassy. In fact, he translated Kennedy's speech uh, before Lincoln Gordon uh, handed it to Goulart uh, at the, I think, Laranjeiro's Palace uh, on the, uh, the night the missile crisis became public. Um, and they were clearly exploring 
what readiness there was in the military uh, and other anti-communist circles for some kind of action, but they had not yet given up hope that Gordon, uh, that Goulart, possibly with the help of Santiago Dantes, who would be a uh, finance minister in early 1960s, could be put on the track of Brazil remaining democratic and pro-American, pro-Western enough that the U.S. did not have to support a military coup. By early 1964, the situation had changed, and of course, there's still a dispute about exactly how much the U.S. knew and was involved in the coup. Uh, it's clear they supported the coup, but it, it, it's, so far as I know, it, it's never been clarified whether the coup would have happened anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, there will be perhaps a complement to this uh, question posed by the same question, but uh, I have two other questions sure. with me. Secret, the other identified. Professor Hershberg, thank you for your lecture. I would like to know to... Uh, do the historical documents confirm the allegations that Ambassador Vasco Litão da Cunha's wife was responsible for recruiting Juanita Castro to work secretly for the CIA against her own brother? Thank you, Guilherme Kisten Marshall. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you have all seen the reports that came out in 2009, and that is because Juanita Castro published her memoirs, Fidel y Raul, Mis Hermanos. Fidel and Raul, my brothers. And that was the first time she spoke openly about the role of Virginia Latea de Cunha in contact with the CIA in Havana and then in Mexico City so they could recruit her. Now, it, the evidence that I have gathered from documents indicates uh, the word recruit implies pushing. Uh, it seems that in parallel, they both became disillusioned with Fidel Castro uh, and the Cuban revolution for going too far in a communist direction. So I don't think Juanita Castro needed to be pushed to uh, oppose her brother. They, they both, in, in, in parallel, became, lost, lost support. For, they were both very enthusiastic at the beginning. But it seems that it was Virginia who put Juanita in contact with the CIA, so she could act on her, on 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 her on on her opposition to her brother. She defected in June 1964 in Mexico City. She came to Brazil. She was helped by both de Cunhas. This was after the coup in in Brazil, and she actually then was helped to go to Chile to uh, uh, denounce the Chilean left's contacts with Fidel Castro for the, in the 1964 Chilean elections. And she was a CIA asset for some years. Many of her CIA documents are now available from the American uh, archives. Thank you. One methodological question. Yes. Uh, you have mentioned that you push your students to compare <laughs> the newspapers to act of foreign policy. How is that done? Speech analysis? I'd like to know more about the methodology adopted sure. to make these analyses. Sure. Part of the assignment, at least for me, uh, and the teaching assistants, is it's very open-ended. I give the students a choice of several events during the Cold War, and I give them directions how to gain access to the collections of declassified, previously secret documents. And I do not expect them to write a publishable research paper, but I say, okay, in eight to 10 double-spaced pages, compare some aspect, some part of how the event was covered Times or Washington Post at the time to how the same event appears in secret documents. And so they could compare a public statement, a speech, uh, leaks to a journalist, a column by uh, a, a commentator, but they have to compare what did the public know to what did you know if you were authorized to read secret documents. And they sometimes find very interesting results. Sometimes they find the public had an accurate 
knowledge of some part of the story. Sometimes they find that they had no knowledge whatsoever of an important part of the story or that they had part of the story but it was misleading because they did not know about another part that was only available if you had access to the secret documents. Um, but it's just, I, it's, it's funny, uh, most of my students, I always ask for a show of hands, how many of you are studying history? And it's always a very small number. Most people are studying economics or political science or government, and they are interested in current politics. But every semester, a few students switch to history because they become interested in, I mean, it, 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 it's like being a detective, you know, to put clues together to either answer old questions or come up with new questions or uh, come up with new stories or uh, really uh, not just what is the lesson, what does it mean in 25 words or less, but the journey is the destination sometimes because sometimes the details of the process can really help you understand what it was like to live through at the time, not just to look back 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. Okay, uh, my boss, Ambassador Morel Lima, has a question Please. to you. <laughs> I would like to, uh, when I was coming here, someone asked me, uh, why does Brazil matter to better comprehend the 1962 uh, crisis? And, um, uh, and I, I thought, uh, of uh, what I was referring to before, uh, the question of a hemispheric uh, solidarity, to preserve hemispheric solidarity, to prevent a conflict, to create greater awareness uh, on the part of uh, social economic problems that were. But you have mentioned something that uh, something that's, uh, that's of uh, uh, great importance is, in a way, the contribution that Brazil gave to Tratelogo, and I would like you to elaborate a little bit uh, on, on uh, that. On Brazil's role in the indirect dialogue? Uh, uh, how Brazil, uh, how in your perception was uh, the contribution uh, of Brazil uh, to the process that ended up in the Tratelogo uh, uh, nuclear uh, treaty? Tratelogo, yes. Nuclear. Thank um, you. It is, the, the question is how this ended up leading to Catalco. It is not, of course, a, a straight line. And there are some divergences. For example, the rivalry between Brazil and Argentina is interesting. It even came up during the missile crisis. Um, and also, one thing that's very interesting, uh, the conference I'm going to in Goiania, I just read a paper last night. Uh, with new evidence about how, while Itamarati was supporting Tlatelelco process and, and, and the idea of denuclearization, an atom-free, nuclear weapons-free zone in Latin America, that Brazilian nuclear scientists opposed this idea. They wanted Brazil to keep its options open, uh, both in terms of peaceful nuclear power, but also what were known as peaceful nuclear explosions, this was that I could use nuclear explosions to dig harbors, divert rivers, mine for ores. This was a popular idea among some people at the time, but in uh, including in Brazil. But of course, the same explosion that can destroy a city can be a peaceful nuclear explosion if you just have to drop it in a different place. And so there was a real tension within Brazilian policy and between actually Brazil and Mexico over the terms of Tlatelolco um, because Brazil wanted some escape hatches. And of course, this would also produce tension um, between Brazil and the United States 10 years later during Carter, you know, when Brazil made a nuclear technology agreement with West Germany. And the U.S. saw this as a danger limits to nuclear proliferation. And of course, Brazil did not sign the NPT. Um, but the missile crisis stimulated thinking. And also, for a moment, 
it seemed that Brazil might have the answer. And one thing that's fascinating I did not mention is, uh, remember Gateo de, uh, de Cunha, who I spoke about have, that he was the amba Brazilian ambassador in Havana from November 1956 through the last two years of Batista, and then until February 1961, so for the first two years of Fidel in Havana. In the spring of 19, he then went to Moscow. And from 1962 until the beginning of 1964, he was the Brazilian ambassador to the Soviet Union. And so during the missile crisis, de Cunha was actually sending cables from Moscow. And he actually tested the water. And, and it seems that he got the approval of Frol Kozlov, who was the deputy prime minister, for the idea of a nuclear-free zone in Latin America as an uh, umbrella for the withdrawal of the Soviet missiles from Cuba. So there was a moment, and this was discussed by Kennedy and Rusk, and it's funny, um, uh, the American Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military, uniform military leaders, and also the, uh, they did not like the idea because they said, well, what about the Panama Canal Zone? What about nuclear rights in Puerto Rico? What about nuclear rights in Guantanamo? You know, and JFK said, we just want to get those missiles out of Cuba. You know, if that's what it takes, you know, he was so desperate to end that crisis without escalation your war and so afraid that if the U.S. attacked Cuba that Khrushchev would retaliate in Berlin or against Turkey or somewhere else, that he was desperate to find a, a peaceful solution. So there was the moment where, we, uh, where Brazilian diplomacy uh, almost played that role. And again, just to make another comment on your question, you know, this is part of a larger effort that I have become interested in over the last 20 years, including uh, regarding the Vietnam War. The United States has a habit when it doesn't like a country, it sometimes just breaks relations, no embassy. So when the U.S. then gets into a conflict or is about to get into a war, it often is third countries who rush in to either try to prevent the war or to limit the war or to end the war. And so my last book is about secret communist diplomacy and the Vietnam War, where various countries like Poland and Hungary and France and, uh, and others became deeply involved uh, in trying to start peace talks between Washington and Hanoi, North Vietnam, when there was no direct diplomatic communication. But there is a secret history waiting to come out about third parties who tried to stop the U.S. war against Iraq, 90, uh, 1991, um, after the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, every one of these situations, third parties that have relations with both sides, a story that allow you to go beyond what you can learn in the archives in Washington. And, uh, you know, this is uh, an effort that I think has really expanded our understanding of indirect international communications. And your know, third countries as mediators can play an important role. And in fact, I would recommend if anyone is interested in Cuba, uh, there's a fantastic new book um, called Back Channel to Cuba, which is all about 50 years, actually more than 50 years, including the story that I told you today of secret communications between Washington and Havana leading up to the breakthrough a uh, year and a half ago between Obama and Raul Castro. And it is a fascinating story. Peter, uh, Peter, Peter, Peter Kornblum and uh, William Leo Grand. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, your question is a part of the prehistory of Interesting to say. Before uh, passing the floor to our um, former ambassador in Mexico, Ambassador Sergio Florencio, I would like to remember uh, e relembrar o, os estudantes que quiserem seguir mais essa história. Esta noite, o professor James Hirschberg vai dar uma outra palestra sobre o mesmo assunto no Uniceub, Centro Universitário de Brasília, às 19h30, no Auditório 1. Todos estão convidados, quem quiserem continuar esse importante debate. Ambassador Sérgio Florencio, por favor. Presentation, various simulations. But one particular point 
during the meeting, uh, this point was your reference to the fact that the, this historical event Thomas related to the missile crisis. You mentioned that it is very understudied. Mm -hmm. It is uh, it is not researched uh, this issue, and uh, I am convinced that silence mm -hmm. about historical events are extremely eloquent. <laughs> I remember uh, Professor Aaron Hayes recently mentioned that uh, the Brazilian military coup is very understudied and it is understudied because it is in the interest of some actors not to study deeply. So what is your interpretation about the silence over this historical event? Thank you. Well, it is a combination of factors, I think. Sometimes there are political reasons for silence. Um, but in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis and Brazil's role, there's a much simpler explanation, which is that many of the U.S. documents that have the detailed references to the Brazilian intercession in Havana at U.S. request, um, when they were first declassified in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, all references to Brazil were blacked out or whited out from the documents. And one thing that's funny is um, it was so secret at the time that there are many editorials that were in leading Brazilian newspapers condemning Goulart for trying to butt into, to to uh, interfere with the superpower diplomacy by sending this emissary to Havana. And I found even in secret documents, the Canadian ambassador, the British ambassador, the Chilean ambassador, when they reported on this, they attributed this intervention to Goulart's grandiose, egomaniacal, you know, self-importance and trying to show Brazil matters in the world. And it's funny, even in a couple of cases, they spoke to Lincoln Gordon, and Lincoln Gordon said nothing about his own role in stimulating Hermes Lima to do this. Um, so the secret was kept at the time, and it's funny. Uh, I interviewed Lincoln Gordon. He's the late Lincoln Gordon. He, he died several years ago. But in, in the late, when I first learned about this story by looking at American documents from cables written by Lincoln Gordon, Lincoln Gordon to get his personal recollections. And he was at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Good lesson. I don't know. How many of you are actually historians? Any of you? Okay. Oral history, of course, is very important to history. You know, some, not everything is written down in documents. But not everything is written down in memories. Not everything is written down accurately in memories because I had a very pleasant conversation with Lincoln Gordon. But as an experiment, before I, I had a stack of documents to show him, but as an experiment, I just said, it is Brazil and the Cuban Missile Crisis. What, do you, what are your memories of that? And he spoke for an hour. I don't know if any of you ever met Lincoln Gordon, but he spoke for a long time. He, had, he was very, very happy to speak. He remembered detailed, gave me detailed accounts of discussions with Goulart, detailed accounts of discussions with Santiago Dantas, detailed discussions of Brazilian politics, and did not mention one word about a secret effort to send a message between John Kennedy and Fidel Castro through Brazil. And then when I mentioned it, at first he dismissed it, and then I showed him his own cables that, that he had written about 40, almost 40 years earlier. <laughs> 
kill someone for me. No, no, be, be, because these were personal. I said to, you know, he told me, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the key moment was at midnight at the uh, apartment near Ipanema of, of, of Hermes Lima, of, of Lincoln Gordon going to his apartment and, and having this meeting in the middle of the night. Uh, and, and finally he read it over and it was clear a lie. He was not trying to conceal. He was not trying to hide it. It's simply when he was in Brazil for you know as many years as he was, about five years, there were so many crises. There were so many tumultuous events. Overwhelming priority was bilateral U.S.-Brazilian relations. That this Cuban episode was just a little blip. It was a tiny distraction. But it just was a great example that you need documents and oral history together because other priority, you know, are never written down or they're written down in a deliberately distorted way to influence the policy process. So I, I think the, most historians working on the Cuban Missile Crisis had no special reason politically to exclude Brazil's role. They simply were focused on other aspects. Also, the most important thing is that until the 1990s, there was virtually no Soviet side of the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was only at the end of Gorbachev and in the last years of the Soviet Union that it even began to come out. So there were simply other priorities. But the story was concealed from American documents, but then it began to come out, and then when I got interested in it from a Soviet document, I realized that the story is A, fascinating, and B, important, but C, together without combining documents from many different sources and, and countries, because the story is not in just one country's archive alone. But, I, you know, I, 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 I think it's, uh, there are plenty of cases of historical amnesia uh, that have interesting causes. I mean, I lived through the end of the Vietnam War in the 1970s, as you, and it's funny, I've been uh, days, hours of the American helicopter leaving the embassy in Saigon. Americans did not want to be reminded that Vietnam ever existed, unless they were so unfortunate as to have fought there or have a family member who is directly involved. America just wanted to forget that it existed, just like um, a lot of Americans would be happy to forget that Iraq and Afghanistan uh, uh, ever existed, given the way that's gone. But historical amnesia is a very interesting subject. Some amnesia are induced, yeah, self-induced. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And some self-induced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have come to a close. I'd like to uh, I would like to add, to thank Professor James Hirschberg for uh, his uh, for sharing with us his knowledge on uh, these uh, things, and I would like to invite you once again to think about uh, to, to think about the episode and to study it further, uh, because uh, these are, uh, for instance, I do not uh, share with uh, uh, with him what he has just said about. Uh, uh, Lincoln Gordon, in the sense that uh, he was paying too much attention to bilateral <laughs> issues, and because the uh, Cuban missile was such, uh, had such an enormous Im impact uh, in the whole hemisphere, that uh, of course that uh, this was uh, something that uh, the, the, we cannot underestimate the impact of this, uh, in not in oh, all the affairs, absolutely. and also in the in the within the hemisphere. Um, I do not also share with him, just for the record, the, the reference uh, to Tlatelolco, because of course you find uh, in Brazil always in the middle of the, mm -hmm. the military, so some people that are more hardline. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would like to, for the record, to emphasize the role of Brazil in the preparing the Tlatelolco agreement, mm -hmm. which was very uh, constructive. And Brazil ended up by doing the same when it uh, played a very important role in the Law of the Sea Treaty, when it also installed in the preamble uh, 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 a reference to the Atlantic Ocean as a free nuclear zone. So this is a very important constructive role that Brazil has been doing on the basis of its values and of its principles.
But Professor, once again, thank you very much. And thank you very much for attending this seminar.